Maybe I should start with a, with a question to you guys. Do you know why you cannot tickle yourself? <laughs> why can you not tickle yourself? Sorry? Exactly. That's very good. You already know what is coming. When I tickle myself, eh, my brain is sort of like, ah, yeah, that's Dan Rosegarden. We're going to ignore that. Eh? But when you tickle your neighbor right now, Hello, people, when you are tickling your neighbor right now, it's okay, you can do it, it's an experiment, uh, you can blame me. <laughs> then you get a new experience somehow. And I think, I think, seriously, this is very, very interesting. So apparently, there are new experiences, new emotions that we cannot do alone. Eh? We need each other to communicate, to interact. And I think, you know, in a weird way, this is really important. When we talk about the future or the new or the innovation, we cannot do things alone. We need to work together. Like the famous uh, author Marshall McLuhan once said, at spacecraft Earth, there are no passengers. We are all crew. We have to work together in order to make new things happen. And I think today I want to talk about that. Our planet Earth, us human beings, because for me, at the same time, it's very, very clear that this old system is crashing. Eh? Crashing in terms of economy, in terms of energy. And at the same time, the new world is maybe a bit unknown. Eh? We, we are not sure how it looks like. We, are sort, yeah, we don't know how it will feel like. And on one hand, maybe this is a bit scary, eh? that we're sort of like uncertain about it. But on the other hand, I think it's really, really interesting because it forces us, again, to be creative. Yeah. And so if you are a student or an entrepreneur or a designer or the new government or a politician, we have to be creative again to survive. And I think that's really interesting about it in a time like this. Um, so today I want to take you on a little tour, so to speak, a sort of safari through this new world. How will it look like? How will it feel like? How can we experience that? And um, for in my case, as a designer, as an artist, this started uh, five or six years ago when I walked into uh, my studio and I saw the following image on the desktop of one of my designers. When I saw the following image uh, on the desktop of one of my designers, and it was this one. <laughs> Reality, worst game ever. <laughs> and, and, you know, like, uh, you know, maybe it's a bit sad. Eh? <laughs> maybe he has no social life, I don't know. But uh, he uh, was a great uh, uh, prog programmer, by the way. But in, on the other hand, it's true, you know, I love technology. Technology liberates us. We can exchange, we can, we can share, we can enhance ourselves. But at the same time, we live in a time where we are sort of, we are, we are stuck to the screen. We are looking at screens the whole day. That's weird. You know, are we becoming more machine or more human? I say that that's sort of a weird clash we are in right now. So I became fascinated with this. Like, I don't want this. I don't want to look at screens the whole day. So what happens when technology jumps outside the computer screen and becomes a part of the things that we wear, the roads that we drive on, the, the, the cities we inhabit? Um, and that's the way I started to design. So, for example, this was one of the first interactive landscapes we made, uh, placed in an old pedestrian tunnel in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, hundreds of fibers which react to the sounds and the motion of people walking by. So sometimes it's following you, yeah, very friendly, like, like, like an animal. Sometimes it's connecting people, yeah, like, like a sort of matchmaking, like a mediator. It's like an animal, huh? And I like it because it became very... <laughs> we film people from a distance, so they, are not, they don't know we're filming. This is what people did, you know, we placed it there, public space, and people start to play it becomes intuitive in a way. You want to engage with the world around you. <laughs>
and, and sometimes it's a bit scary, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 and, and so this was very interesting for me, at least, that um, using, uh, making environments which are open, which, which can connect to you, which react to your sound or your motion. So yes, there are microchips and software and sensors, but you don't see them. You don't have to understand them. There is no manual. It's just you making a new landscape. And placing it in this kind of pedestrian tunnel, uh, pedestrian tunnel, suddenly things started to happen. Um, before, it was a very dark, a bit scary tunnel. Eh? People didn't really like to go there. But when we placed June, after three or four weeks, something very surprising happened. And that's the following image. This is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it became a hotspot for wedding couples to have their photo taken. Eh? So they went, it's their day, their moment, eh? and June reacts to what they are doing. So they went there and whoop, eh, made a lot of noise. So June reacts to that. And they started to send me these photos, which on one hand are complete kitsch. Eh? <laughs> they are maybe for me horrible. Eh? As a <laughs> Uh, uh, but the other hand, maybe it's, it's really beautiful. But what I liked about it, so suddenly it was invaded by these wedding couples who would go there, have a photo taken and leave again. So it became very famous for that. So you can transform space. Eh? You can transform a very old, scary tunnel to something poetic, to something which, which engages people. I think this is really interesting, how we can, what I like to call, create techno-poetry the poetic side of technology, not about microchips, but to make the world, again, more personal, more connected. And so I'm saying we, because this is not just me. Eh? I have a lot of ideas, and I, I know a bit how to, to do it, but at the same time, I am nothing alone. I have to work like a network. So it was like five or six years ago that I started my own studio. This is Studio Rose Garden in the Netherlands, um, and we have a second one in Shanghai, in China where we work with a team of scientists, uh, architects, the WizKids, eh, software and electronic uh, uh, bit, bit nerds, eh, they're, they're, they're great, uh, 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 fashion designers. And so with each project, we team up in order to make it happen. You have to work together if you want to get the quality and, and the excellence, which I think is necessary. And so sometimes we have clients, eh, commissions, like a mayor or art collector or a museum. But also, with the success of June, which started to travel around the world, we decided to not just work for clients. Because, I'm sorry to say, but <laughs> clients are sometimes a bit stupid. <laughs> <laughs> because they always want what they already know, which is boring. So, so, so you want to do something new. So what we did is we started our own projects. So we, we had the little bit of money we made. We did not buy a new car but we started a new project, something we thought was interesting, to not copy-paste, but to copy-morph, to learn, to, to, to make mistakes, to evolve, to experiment. And one of the first projects we did with that was a project called Intimacy. It's a fashion project, the future of fashion, where we discovered a material which can change in transparency. It's sort of like a foil, like a liquid crystal. When you slightly power it, so it changes from white to transparent, and from transparent to white. And we decided to make a series of dresses from this, connected to the heartbeat of the wearer. So the more, the more, how do I say this, the more excited she becomes, <laughs> Hey, self-project. Eh? So, uh, going from black, from white to transparent, or going here from black to transparent. So it's sort of like a, or sorry, this is the white one. This is the black one. So it's, it's sort of like a digital goosebump. Eh? So the faster the heartbeat goes, the more she reveals of herself. And and okay, this project went online, it went viral for all the obvious reasons, of course. <laughs> and, but for me, seriously, it was interesting to not say, let's look at the screen, but to make something wearable, something which is connected to your, how you feel, to your body. And so also this traveled around. We got a lot of positive feedback, but there were also some people who said, who, who were a bit skeptical. 
And they said, yeah, Dan, that's a great idea, and we like you and your work, but why only for ladies? <laughs> you should also do something for men. Eh? That's not fair. And so I told them, yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. Eh? I had to think about it a bit. And so right now we are working on a suit for men. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> it only becomes transparent when they lie. <laughs> so, yeah. it's, it's selling horrible, by the way, <laughs> but, but it's interesting. So, 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 connect technology with poetry and explore new worlds. And so, what was interesting, before I started this project, I did know nothing, I didn't know anything about fashion. I mean, I'm a guy, you know, what do I know? It's like, but because of this, suddenly we got calls from fashion designers from the fashion industry, and they were like, oh, that's interesting, and we didn't under really understand it one year ago, but now we understand. Hey, we, we, we have to work with technology, with personalization. And one company specifically called us one year later, or two years later, actually, and it was Lacoste. Hey, you know Lacoste is a bit, this, this, this crocodile uh, brand, a bit, bit boring, but very, uh, very high-end elite. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, when, <laughs> I'm Dutch, so when I make jokes about someone, it's a sign of respect. This is, uh, yeah, <laughs> you have to know this. Anyway, but so they, they called uh, us, and we were in contact with them. And um, they, we had a meeting, eh, the future of fashion, and they called us eight or nine months later, and they said, ah, we, we have thought about it, we have teamed up, and we have a movie we would like to show you. Because the problem with Lacoste is, is that although they are very famous, they are being copycats, eh? they are being copied like crazy. So, and they don't like that because it's not the right quality, people think it's real but it's not, etc. So they spend 3 million euro per year on lawyers to defend, eh? to fight. And they are so tired of that, they are tired of that future. And so we met with them and said, okay, let's spend half a million, not on defending, but on investing in something new you know, like, like fight ahead, not, not just defense. And so the following movie is what popped up from our conversation, the future of fashion. It's so fresh, just like the Wow, wow. And, and so this was really exciting because suddenly they change as a company. They don't just sell t-shirts, they sell information. And okay, I think 50% of the things that you just saw are not possible yet, <laughs> yet, yet. I, I, you're right. But the other 50% are possible, eh? like the, the light emitting or the changing letters doable. Give me five whiskets, five smart whiskets, eight months and a pizza hotline, and you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe I have them. So, but what is interesting is that new industry, in order to survive, they need to invest in new ideas, and they start, the smart companies start to understand that. And that's interesting because it creates a playground for you guys to experiment, to, 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 to learn. They are open for new ideas because they have to. And that's, I think, really interesting. You should claim that territory. It's, it's your freedom, in a way. And so you see that suddenly an art project, intimacy, start, suddenly starts to influence the industry, in a way. And in a way, that is something which is interesting for me. Or this. Uh, 
Lotus. This is what I do uh, the whole day <laughs> in, the, in the studio. So. <laughs> I have a great job. <laughs> so, so here we question ourselves, what does nature mean in a city? Eh? I, I, I'm aware I'm in Thailand and you have great uh, in, uh, nature. And nature is very important in, in uh, Koh Lanta and Krabi and that area. I've, I've been there s several times myself. But what does nature mean in a city like Bangkok, which is, you know, a bit hard and cars and concrete? So how can we bring back nature there? What can we learn from that? And you know that it's not just about planting trees and placing grass also, but mo it's also what can we learn from the principle of nature and to implement that. You are, there's a difficult word which describes that, which is called biomimicry. So learning from nature and implement it in the world of today. And so what you see here is lotus, basically a foil, which based on the heat of your breath, folds open like a flower, yes? And when it cools down, it's, it shrinks again. Everything does this, by the way. Yeah? The chair you're sitting on, this building, your body, everything becomes bigger and smaller because of heat. And this created, this invention, allowed us to make something which is very natural, without battery, without mechanism. And we started to decide that to uh, apply this here in a church. This is in Lille. Lille is a very weird city. This is in France. We got a call from the mayor of Lille. And she's very active. And she loves the city. And she loves this kind of cultural heritage buildings. And this is a very famous church, 1700 uh, century. Uh, early Renaissance, and they spent a lot of time, money, and energy to restore these kind of buildings, uh, to treasure them. They are proud of that. But at the same time, the problem with this kind of architecture is that um, nobody goes there. <laughs> it's really sad. Nobody goes there. They are disconnected from reality. And so the mayor, she was very frustrated about that. And she called me and said, Dan, you have to make something. You, it's like that, eh? You have to make something. To, to make this alive again, to make this history alive. And I thought that was a really good question that she asked. And so we decided to make the first Lotus Dome from them. The following movie is Inside the Church. So this is what happens when you walk around, the light follows you, it opens up, and it, it reveals the church, eh, which is very dark. And what was happening is suddenly people started to, to look around again, to watch at the church. And we had people, an older couple, who lived around the corner for, I think, 50 years. And they were there walking around, playing with Lotus Dome while I was there, and they didn't know who I was. And they, and they sort of suddenly, they said to each other, eh? suddenly they saw these little stone angels there eh? lighting up. And they were like, oh, look at that, it's so beautiful. And we were like, yeah, hello, it's already been there for 300 years. You know, like, <laughs> hello, why are you not looking? <laughs> and they were like, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so that's very interesting. Suddenly, 14,000 visitors in four weeks. Eh? So it's about connecting the old and the new world. It's not about saying old is bad, new is good. No, 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 no. It's not that easy. It's about finding the link, finding the connection, and to discover again, in a way. And I think that, that that's sort of really powerful. And also here, 
talking about nature, talking about architecture, talking about innovation. Also, when we talk about sustainability and when we talk about future, a lot of it is about saying, do less. Eh? Sustainability, you have to do less. Less car, less material, less flying. And I think, I think that's wrong. I don't think that's good. I think we should do more, not less. And so, one, this is 2008, 2009, where a couple of entrepreneurs in Rotterdam came up with the idea to make the first sustainable dance floor. And we worked together with them to realize it. And this is not a normal dance floor, because when you dance, eh, when you go to a club, you move, eh, etc. You do that, but nothing is happening with the energy. And so we were like, hey, maybe we should do something with this energy that you have and generate electricity. Toyota, a sponsors of green design. Every time we take a step, we leave energy behind. What if we could capture this energy as a clean source of electricity? Dutch architects Dole are developing the technology to capture the energy of dancers like these, then using it to power the club's music and lights. Certain materials produce electricity when squeezed. This is known as the piezo effect. So a dance floor can become one big generator, turning every movement into new power. In fact, any vibrations we make can generate electricity. Even the rattle of the tram taking you home at the end of the night. Green Design, sponsored by Toyota, aiming for zero emissions. And so the principle is actually very easy. It's the same like on your bicycle. Eh? You have a dynamo, and, the cycle, da -da, and then you get light. Here, the tile moves like eight or nine millimeters up and down, and each tile produces around 20, 25 watts, which is actually quite a lot eh? if you want to charge um, your iPhone or, 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 or electricity for lighting and all these kind of things. So it's interesting, you know? Let's be part of the solution instead of the problem. Let's be active instead of doing less. And the, the, the design is made in such a way that, we, because we have very little power, so we used uh, LEDs and mirrors to create this sensation of depth. Yeah? So the more you dance, the deeper the floor gets, which actually is, 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 is quite scary, to be honest. Um, and we also programmed, you see it there right above, this, this little green ghost, yes? And it is programmed in such a way to go to the area where the most energy is produced. So people start to dance a lot eh, because they want to catch it, eh, they want to attract it. So we get more energy, so we can charge the lighting or the DJ booth, etc., etc. It's a win-win situation. Yeah. Really interesting way of connecting sustainability with, with being active, with doing more in that way. And so this connection also here between something very poetic and at the same time something very pragmatic um, was in the back of my brain while Sustainable Dance Floor was traveling around the world. One day I was sitting in a car on a highway somewhere in Europe and I looked outside and suddenly I was really amazed. You know, all these roads, the roads we drive on, we spend so much time and energy on them. But it's so weird, because when we talk about innovation, when we talk about mobility, everybody always focuses on the car. Yes? A car can be beautiful, or designy, or glamorous, or sustainable, or expensive. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, they, you have them here in the shopping malls, eh? the, 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 the Bentley, and all the, that's proud. But the roads? No, 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 no. They should be cheap and maintenance-free. I think that's weird, because the roads is what we see. This is our interface. This could be our interface of information and experience. So I started to think, based on the dance floor and the other projects we did, can we not make a smart highway, energy neutral, beautiful? And we started to, to work on that ourselves. And I came up with this idea of developing coatings, sort of smart paints, which charge at daytime and Glow at night, yeah, similar to the glow in the dark paint that you know eh, when you're a boy or a girl in the ceiling. Yes, you, you know, yes. Well, okay, that fades out after 30 minutes, so that's sort of useless. But so you have to go back 
to the lab, and we started to work on that. But then still, you have an idea. So what? There are so many people with ideas. That, that, that is just the beginning. And so one day, I was very lucky. I have to admit, I was lucky. Sometimes you need luck. Yeah? I gave a talk for the Dutch government, yeah, who's very keen in investing in creative industry. And I gave a talk about my love for smart highways. And this guy on the right, he was sitting in the audience. I did not know that. And he is the director of Heimans, one of the largest road manufacturers in the, ne in the Netherlands, in the Benelux. And he was sitting in the audience listening to me. And he was like, whoa, that's us. You know, that's my industry. And so he called me the next day with a very basic, almost banal question after looking this uh, smart lighting paint. Hey, I'm an artist, so I have a lot of dreams. But he called me with a very basic question, which was, come on, guys, what, what did he ask? Exactly, how much? How much for the paint? How much? How much? I want to buy. And we're like, no, 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 no. It's not that easy, mister. <laughs> we are not selling a product. I'm interested in process. I want to learn from me, from you. You might want to learn from me because I don't have only one idea. I have 20 ideas. So we need to work together to make something happen. Very important to say no sometimes, to get a good yes. It's very important. No, no, serious. You have to sometimes say no and then wait a bit, eh? like wait. And so after waiting for three or four weeks, and they kept on asking, how much, how much? Eh? <laughs> and like, oh, but come on, Dad, you have to tell us. But to be honest, at that time, we really didn't know yet. But <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't tell them that. But uh, um, we decided to sign an agreement to work together the coming five years to make a lot of ideas happen. So here you see us on the rooftop uh, in the head office, uh, the boss and me, um, where we signed the first agreement. And this is also very important because this is innovation, yes? It is not just about great design or great materials. It is about the guts to work together. Although you're different, although maybe you don't understand each other perfectly, but you have to work together to make something new. The These are the ideas we're building right now. can save energy while improving road safety and will debut mid next year. Glow in the dark road markings use photoluminescent paint, which charges during the day and can light roads for up to 10 hours at night. The temperature responsive road paint shows ice crystal patterns when temperatures fall below zero to warn drivers of slippery roads. Interactive lights light up when vehicles approach and dim as they pass by saving energy when there is no traffic on the road. Wind lights get energy from roadside pinwheel generators. They light up using the draft produced by passing vehicles. Induction priority lanes are layered with induction coils under the tarmac to recharge electric cars as they drive. The various technologies will be introduced in the Dutch province of Brabant starting mid-2013. Yeah. And that was really exciting. So we started to work together. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So we, we started to work together to, to, to realize this. Uh, we're doing a pilot in the Netherlands. Eh? We're taking a, a piece of, 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 of highway. We're testing from May, uh, last May to September, making mistakes, learning, failing, updating, eh? learning by doing. But here you see the first version. We're implementing the latest, the matured version in two or three weeks, glowing at night. And uh, you know, it's, it's energy neutral, and it's also just incredibly beautiful. <laughs> I think that's good. Eh? And um, here you see, this is our, our, our Minister of Transportation, our Dutch minister. She's very happy as well, so a Dutch, Dutch innovation. Anyway, um, 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 so, so, so suddenly what happened is that suddenly people got really excited about roads. Eh? Usually it was very boring, now it was fun. And we had shikes from Qatar suddenly calling, how much for a thousand kilometer? And all these, it, you know, it changed, everything changed. Up to this kind of. Olanda, Tokyo movies, which popped up. 
あの一部の地域で、うん、あのスマート高速道路ができるんですよ、うん、電気自動車の充電が、うん、あの自動に走りながらできる、えー、走りながらできるの<笑>、はい、そ,うですその他にもオランダでは、はい、車の接近を察知して照明が点灯する道路や風力発電を利用した街灯など未来に向けてエコな取り組みが行われています。So, so people get excited about the environment again, and I think that's really important. And also, while we are launching Smart Highway International,、um, we learn. And we learned also that it's not just about the roads, but it's also about bicycle paths. I think also here in Bangkok, it could be really interesting. You have the bicycles. Maybe we should make a beautiful light emitting bicycle lane, yes, for Bangkok to, 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 to be proud, to be good、uh, in a way. But we can talk about that later.、Um, this is a project where we were asked by、uh, the province in an area where Van Gogh lived, a famous Dutch painter. And he lived there in 1883 till 1885. Very famous. A lot of tourists go there, take pictures of that area. But there's just one problem、um, there is nothing to see. <laughs> Because he died, yes, okay. And, and, and the paintings are in a museum, so there's nothing to see in that area, but still a lot of people go there because hey, they want to feel him. And so, I don't, yeah, okay, anyway.、Um, and so the government asked us, can you make something to make him feel more alive again? Okay, and、uh, we started to think about that. So what we did is we took the, the light emitting coatings, hey, the, the, the glowing lines. And we chopped them up in little pieces, in little、uh, corals, how do you say it, Cross, crisps. And we looked at the famous paintings of Van Gogh, which he made later on in, in, in France. And also here, we, we started to connect. So, yeah. Basically, this is how my brain works. Like, <laughs> like, sometimes life is simple.、Yeah. Shall I just keep on doing this for like an hour and see what happens? And then, I have no idea. And this is what we're building right now. So, a bicycle path through the area where, where he worked.、Um, so, he lived right above, he lived there. Light,、uh, left below, he made a very famous painting. And it's sort of in the swirls a la Van Gogh. And, you know, we're launching this in November. So, if you go to the Netherlands, please go. It's public, it's free, you can do whatever you want. Want to do. And it's like you're walking through stars, you know? It's, it's really, really special in that way for me.、Yeah. How much? <laughs> okay, this lecture is over. You know, like, okay, bye. <laughs> I will tell you later.、Um, <laughs> so,、um, all these projects that I've shown you, don't get me wrong, it is not easy. It's not easy. It's not like, okay, you get a call, you have a great idea, you get some great people, ta da da, ta da, and then everything is good. No, 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 no. You have a lot of problems to, just, to get just a little bit of poetry, yes? A lot of problems, a little bit of poetry. You have to fight for it. You have to resist because people are always a bit skeptical. Like, how much and does it work? And should we do. Like, like the, the complaining. People are complaining a lot. And also, what people do a lot. Is that they say they want innovation, we want innovation, we want something new. But when you propose something, a new idea, when you propose a new idea to your wife, or your boss, or your girlfriend, or your mother, or your father, there is a sort of tendency within ourselves to reply every good new idea starting with two words not how much. We already had that. <laughs> What are they saying? Come on, guys. Sorry? No, 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 no. No, it's, 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 it's deeper. Yes, but. Yes, but. It's too expensive. It's too cheap. It's too beautiful. It's too ugly. It's too fast. It's too slow. 5,000 reasons to not do something. And that's horrible because there are also five reasons to do something. But you have to, be, have, to have to have some guts. You have to invest in new ideas. Yes, but it limits ourselves. 
And yes, we should be thinking, yes, and be critical, but we also have to have a little bit of courage. And I experienced a lot of yes but in my life. <laughs> I can tell you that. And I got really, really frustrated about that. I mean, I'm already wearing black, but I got a bit hey, like gray, and it's like not so nice. I was not happy. Too many yes buts. And so one day I decided we should do something with that. We should use that to design. And we designed here what you see is the famous yes but chair. <laughs> Self commissioned. And it's a very simple chair. It looks like a normal chair, but it is not. Because this chair has here a little voice recognition. And the moment you sit on that chair and you say those two horrible, creative, destructive, annoying little words, you get a short but <laughs> pretty intense <laughs> little shock on the backside of your body. <laughs> And um, yeah, that works. Yeah. <laughs> so clients are a bit scared now for us. <laughs> so we, but, but seriously, we have to move away from the yes, but if we want to explore the new world, we have to invest in new dreams. Yeah. So talking about the future, talking about light, talking about technology, talking about nature, talking about the future of light, eh, which I think is for me very interesting. Light started something very personal, eh, a candle in the Middle Ages, something very yeah, which, which you would carry around you. And now it became industrialized, eh, like a lamp, like an LED in 1962. It became cheap, widely available. But what would be the future of light? What would be next step? Well, we believe this will be social. This will be something that is shareable, that you can exchange with each other. And so for the city of Eindhoven, in the Netherlands as well, which have a very rich culture of light. Eh? Philips, the big light company, a light bulb was produced there, etc., etc. And so the city wants to think about the future of light. And we designed one of the first crystal projects for them. Here you see a crystal. So a crystal, I, I will not go too technical, but um, it's actually two LEDs and a copper wire, like this. And we made a floor which has a magnetic field. And so it charges the crystal. It, it makes it give light. So you get something like this. So there's no battery. There's no cable. It is like, you know, your electronic toothbrush? Yeah? That, that thing? Yeah, it gets charged wirelessly. Well, different technology, but same principle. And this is in a public space. And I'll show you a short movie what happens, because they are laying loose on the ground. People can pick them up. I see hundreds of crystal lights. What happens when I touch them? And so people go there and they, they share stories of light. They leave messages behind. And we go, sometimes go there as a studio. And every three or four days, people leave new notes or, or messages behind. It's very, very special. Some people, they steal one. Yeah, they take them home. <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't work. You have to be there yeah, to get it charged. Uh, so it's interesting that, 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 that sharing, it's not about owning it. It's about sharing it, yes? That's really important, I think, in the new world. You don't need to own it. You just need to be able to use it when you need it. And so people leave messages behind. This is in Dutch. 
but um, this is a message saying, can I be your intern? <laughs> and I think in the end we still said no uh, to it, but uh, yeah, yeah. sometimes we say yes. So. so, but it's interesting to make spaces where people can connect, not just via the screen, not just Facebook, like, uh, like, like, but more, more, more intelligent maybe, or more personal. So if you ever go to the Netherlands, oh, I'm telling you to go to the Netherlands a lot of times, but okay. Um, you can go here as well. It's open and public, and, and, and don't, don't steal too many crystals, please. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Um, 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 it's been there now for six or seven months, and we had to convince the client, the mayor, to finance an artwork which, in a way, can be completely stolen, yes? Because if you can share, you can also steal. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and but the mayor said, yes, but I want that, I want that. And so we, we signed an agreement, we will add new crystals, we will open source how you make a crystal so you can do it yourself. But what we realized is that after a while, when we place it there, when we have 95% red crystals and 5% white ones, the white ones are stolen. But if we reverse that, so we have 95% other color, then the other color is being stolen. <laughs> so we can sort of influence uh, the, the type of colors they steal. That's, that's really interesting, yeah. But it's still out there, it's working. Interesting. And here, maybe to conclude, Beijing, China, I, I, I think Asia, I, I love Asia, you know, there's such a power for the future, such a, it's like, like, like more and more and more. But at the same time, it is in a change, in a dramatic change. Smog, air pollution, yes, really, really bad. Hey, you see, this is my view from my room in Beijing. So below is on Monday, I can still see the city around me. And the above one, is on Tuesday and on Wednesday, eh, when all the, the factories start to run and the cars, etc. It's really, really bad. It's like a filter in a way. And so I looked at that one day and I was like, ah, maybe we should do something with that. You know, that maybe this, like Van Gogh has its paint, maybe I have my smog, eh, maybe I can use that to design. Also because it's really, really bad for people. Eh? You, you have this air quality index, yeah, this is, I think, above 50 is already not so good. Yeah? So we use technology to liberate, to enhance, but technology also has side effects that we, we do not have under control, which is hitting us in the face. We're like, oh, what should we do with it? So we should be creative in that way. And so what we did is make something good for people. And what we did is working with air purifier scientists in the Netherlands, to come up with a new idea. And this idea is based on a very simple idea, which is um, when you were a child, hey, when you were, you were playing, and you have a balloon, yeah, a plastic balloon, and you polish it, yeah, it gets static, yes? It starts to attract your hair, yes? This is pure nature, this is pure technology. And so I was standing under the shower one day when I was in Beijing. I was like, ah, maybe we can use that principle to sort of suck things up, eh? to attract smog. And so this is the principle that we're doing. Uh, I won't go too technical, but it's applied in hospitals already where we're on an ionic field, creating an ionic field, so we can clean air on a nanoscale, on a PM 2.5 scale, clean air in, a, in an area where we're literally building the largest air purifier in the world. So we take a park in China or anywhere, we create a sort of magnetic static electric field which sucks up the smog locally and therefore you're creating the cleanest spot in the city. New world. Old world. <laughs> and we, are, we have signed an agreement with the city for the coming three years to realize this. It's a very complex project, but at the same time very simple, in which we say, okay, you're right, this is not the solution. 
you're right. Yeah, that's, of course, clean industry, electrical cars, etc., more cycling, all these kind of things. But we already know that, but still nothing is changing, or it's going too slow. So by making a place which is 75% more clean than the rest of the city, you can smell the future. Yes, you can see the future, you can feel the future. And it is, is it, it is an incentive to work together to make a whole city smog-free. So, working with the government, working with scientists, signing an agreements, and we are in that process right now. Very radical, very extreme, clean air places where you can share, where you can exchange. Um, and we're launching that uh, end of uh, 2015. But also, new things started to happen. This is Beijing smog. <laughs> This is the stuff we were sucking up from the skies. And it's really dirty, you know? It's like, you don't want to put it in your coffee. It's really like, uh, like, like it's like, are, am I breathing this? Eh? Also, Europe had the same problem eh, 40 years ago. So it's not just Asia or Beijing. Every city has this problem. Um, and so we had really like buckets of this stuff uh, standing in our studio while we were prototyping, eh? like all these smog buckets. And we were looking at, at them and like, oh man, what should we do with it? You know, it's taking way too much space and we want to work on new projects. Should we throw this away? Hey, is this chemical waste? What should we do with it? And then, you know, someone in the studio said like, no, 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 stop, stop. You are thinking wrong. This is not waste. This is food for the next, like in nature. Waste does not exist. Waste for the one is food for the other. Think like a circle, think like a network. And so we went back and started to look at the smog itself, the really disgusting, <laughs> the disgusting smog. And we realized that 42, 48 percent of the smog has, exists out of carbon, carbon dioxide. And this is a question to you. What happens when you put carbon dioxide under quite some pressure for a while? You get, yeah, they know the answer. Diamonds. Okay, so that takes a lot of energy. So you might not want to do that, but what we did is put it under pressure for one hour and it starts to crystallize. And so we are making smog rings right now. <laughs> and for guys, we have, uh, how do you call it, cufflinks? So, like, don't worry. And so, by sharing a ring, you donate a thousand cubic meter of clean air to the city. And the city now wants one million of them to share. This is, I think, interesting. To engage people, to share, to be part of the solution, not just part of the problem. And it's a new way of working together to make a city more smart, more clean in a way. And so to conclude, there is so much to explore, guys. <laughs> That makes it really, really exciting. You know, it's not just about technology, it's about mentality. And even in the Netherlands, you know, we live under sea level, yes? So without technology, our whole country would drown, yeah? Would, we would just be gone. We would live on ships or something, I don't know, we would think of something, but it's not good. So from day one, we have invented things to keep dry. These are windmills yeah? to keep the water level in the right uh, position. And here you see a very famous uh, windmill park. This is Kinderdijk, cultural heritage. A lot of tourists go there to take photos, wedding couples, blah, 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 blah. Uh, <laughs> I showed you that, that, that before. And it's funny because now this is cultural heritage. Yeah, people are proud of it. They, are, they, are, they have an emotional value with it. But of course, that's not the reason why they made this. These are landscape machines, yes, to keep the landscape in the right way. And I like that. I learned a lot from this, in a way, that something which starts very practical can become something very poetic. They, they, they need each other, they feed each other. And so right now we are working on Kinderdijk 2.0 to talk about windmills, green energy, where we're not designing a new windmill, but connecting the tipping points of a windmill with each other, lines of light. And so the more wind there is, the more lines start to occur, occur from very calm to very dynamic. So you show nature, yes? New nature, in a way. 
And while we are realizing that, and while our world is shifting and changing and crashing and updating, I'm realizing that this is what we should be doing. We should be willing to make the missing link, yes, between poetry and pragmatism, between fantasy and the Excel sheet, between problems and, and, and poetry, I hope, uh, um, between being a dreamer and between being an entrepreneur. And I think you guys right here, the fact that we are here thinking about the future and trying to learn and trying to do is, I think, the step towards that. And I'm really looking forward to work together with all of you in order to, uh, to update reality in that way. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. I'm interested in the prototyping process that you have. Can you share a little bit about that, what happens in the studio and how much you know, the process you cut off to the field prototyping? The prototyping? Yeah, the prototyping of all the innovations of the projects that you do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the question was, like, how, how does your process work with prototyping? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, you need to have a very hybrid team, a very diverse team. So you need to have scientists, but you also need, like, WizKids or designers or architects. Yeah? They need to work together to make it a complete package. And you're right. I think we're spending a lot of time, money, and energy on prototypes, and some of them you will never know. They fail, or they are not good enough, or they die. So you need to invest in prototypes, in material research, in looking, hey, where, what is interesting in the future? For example, I think the biggest revolutions in the coming five to six years will happen in energy, in health. Yes. So you say, okay, maybe we should explore that field more. So it's a lab of, of, of 3,000 square meters with just 800 prototypes, testing, 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 updating. And then a client comes, or we come up with an idea, and we look around and say, okay, maybe we should use that, and then that, and that, and then we build a prototype, then we build a pilot, bigger one, and then we build a project. So there are sort of three phases. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's very hands-on in that way. You have to try, you have to learn. Uh, but, for example, the lotus foil, eh, the, the movie of the, of the foil opening with my hand, that was eight months of work with five really smart people, you know? That was a lot of time, but we were so happy. We completely fell in love with it. So it's worthwhile. Yeah, 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 yeah. And just pick up on that, do, do companies actually understand the process? Are they, are they supportive of that process? Yeah, I, th I think through the five, six years that we exist, we have had the, the opportunity, the, the, with great fun, to work with very big companies like DSM or Hymons or, or OXO. Eh? These are big, big industrial companies because they need to innovate, but they cannot do it alone, so they ask us to work together. Um, but also great individual whiskets. You need good people. Mm. Uh, and it's sort of my job to put them in a room and say, make a drawing and say, okay, I am not sure what it is yet, but it has to be ready in three months. <laughs> Go. And, and so that's, that's sort of my job, to, to edit, to curate. Um, but I think in Thailand as well, you have a very good craftsmanship notion. Yes, you are, you, you are really building stuff all the time. So the notion of making things is already there. I think you just need to connect it um, to, yeah, to the future. Yeah. That could be interesting. So you work with the, uh, I'm, curi I'm curious about whether you work with a lot of scientists and uh, do you work with uh, any scientists from the biology field? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. And so, uh, what do you think about the future of biology in yeah. design? Thank you, thank you for that question. Um, yes, we work a lot with, with scientists, sometimes individuals, sometimes university, international, or because they have a lot of knowledge, but a lot of knowledge is hidden. It's hidden capital. It's sort of somewhere in a drawer, in a report that nobody reads. So, yeah, this is what happened everywhere. Um, I think the notion of biotechnology is seeing something really, really interesting. So we are working right now where we're taking the luciferine. And the luciferine is the element in a firefly or in a jellyfish which makes that it emits light. 
Okay, it's a whole ecosystem, but that's one of the most important elements. And so we're working together with biological scientists to merge that with plants. So we're working on light-emitting trees. And you can say on one hand, oh, hey, oh, it's nature, you should not touch it. Yeah, it's like sacred, maybe. But on the other hand, it's interesting to see what can we learn from nature. Uh, and, and, you know, we have a brain, let's use it. So yeah, you're right, it's, it's, it's making a studio where people connect. Um, and, and, you know, we always had people telling us it's not allowed, it's not possible, you cannot do it. And it's sort of my job to, to, to prove them wrong and to uh, enjoy that, yeah. yeah. So. But we do have an extensive internship program. And uh, Kurt van Mensvoort, who's lecturing tomorrow as well, so, so if you're interested in that, uh, you can write us a, a message with the crystals uh, if you want. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, guys. Hey, it's been fun. See you next time. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dan Rosegard. Thank you.